still very excited to be here and uh, to talk to all of you. So this is the eighth wave, uh, the eighth wave of the Accelerated Frankfurt program. And uh, I think I've really myself been waiting for, for this moment to, to happen since this is um, the first time that we have an all female program. Uh, when we started in 2015, it was really, you know, we, 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 when Ram started it, uh, the, the whole program, we were focusing in early stage companies and we had fintech and cybersecurity that was our focus. And of course, over the years, then, you know, things have uh, evolved a little bit and we focused more on the, on the go to market program and bringing companies to, to who want to get into the German financial market. But then, you know, Corona happened at, in last uh, large March, and also we had to change a little bit. You know how, how we do how we do business, and and I think it was a, we, we we took the leap to the unknown and uh, moved the program also online. Uh, and in last spring uh, we had the the blockchain wave, and I think it was really a big success. We were personally also I was you know positively surprised that uh, that those companies who did go through the only digital program they uh, online and live more of a, um, a big brother meets uh, lion's den uh, type. Uh, and we had there actually a good response. So many of the companies also got, uh, got, got investments. And that, that was, of course, the, 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 the purpose to try to help st startups to, to find investors and, and really to move on with, with the business. But I think um, over the years, I was, I was always, uh, you know, worried that we had so few women in the program. I mean, we had 40 startups and, and one of them had a female founder, the, the brave Israeli woman who, you know, who actually founded a company. But, uh, and, you know, as, as you guys know, it's, uh, you know, an acceleration program is not really some a, a gold mine or, you know, it, it's more, I think what we do, it is also people ask us, why are you doing it? So I think it's more of a philanthropic, you know, purpose. We really love, you know, working with, with all these entrepreneurs. And I think once you hear the pitches from some of the great four ladies we have here, you understand why we're actually doing this. So it's, it's really, it's, it's a great pleasure to, to help other people and to see, you know, see actually the great progress they can make even in, in such a short time. So, yeah, so this time it was uh, time for, for women. Uh, I always got, you know, I always get tired when people talk about, they only talk, talk, talk and nothing happens. So we thought that, you know, at least the least we can do is that we can, we can do a program you know, directed only to women. And uh, we wanted to be really open and not actually limited to, you know, that what stage they're in or what businesses they're in. But of course, since our background is more in the B2B, so I would say all these ladies also, they are, they, they come from the B2B background. And I think a great variation and, uh, and what I have to say, what, what I really enjoyed about this, that they, they, they worked so good together. I, I think we are, the purpose, of course, from the beginning was to help them or to choose people that, you know, we, we thought are, like I always say, coachable, you know, people who are willing to hear feedback and actually help each other. And I think they totally exceeded our expectations in this way. And of course, all of this wouldn't be possible without the sponsors. So we're really grateful to have here today, you know, um, Calvary. Uh, we have Calvary here and we have uh, Silicon Valley Bank. Maybe you guys can wave a bit. Yeah, so <laughs> Calvary we have here and Silicon Valley Bank. And then of course, Taylor Wessing. They've been with us a long time. And I think there's, there's one guy here who has been here from the very beginning, who actually has been here even before it started. So A to B and Michael Mitrazzi is, is here. And this really, we appreciate the help he has been giving up for us over the years. And uh, if, if I look back, you know, the years and the eight ways uh, that we have had, so of course there are some entrepreneurs who always, you know, stick in our mind and, and uh, you can't go through all of them, but I think maybe a couple of the highlights that we have had over the, the last year or this year is of course that there was a blockchain company, Valega, a Finnish company who got uh, investment and Engrave also from the last actually online uh, program, they also um, got a good investment round going and uh, going back to Israel. So EasySend, one of the earlier programs, they actually just uh, finalized their 70 million round. So I think it's, uh, it shows you that, uh, you know, our babies are growing and, you know, they, 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 they're doing well in life, which is, uh, of course, all that about what we want. Yeah, so maybe in, in a, like, just a summarizing what's been going on. So yes, I think it's been a tough year for all of us. I mean, it's really, I think nobody expected when, when COVID hit us, you know, early March or end of February, that this would be something that would still be going on. Even I, I thought that by summer it should, it should be fine. But I have to say from my own experience, it, it actually, for me, it was, it was actually a good thing because it forced me to do things in, a, in, in different, different things that I had maybe planned. Uh, so some of you maybe know, 
I even published a book, so now I can call myself a writer. But yeah, it was a, it was a, it was an, it was an interesting experience. I think it was you know sometimes it's good to write off things that are taking too much space in your brain, and, and so you can put them aside. So that was an interesting uh, experience. It has at least a very catchy name, "How to Fuck Up Your Startup." So trust me, I have a lot of experience in that, uh, in from my side and watching others do it. So I think that's the that's the idea there. And uh, also what I did, I set up my, I hope fully my, uh, not, maybe not my last startup, but at least the one that I'm really 100% focused in. And it's, you know, taking into account everything that I've done in life. So um, I, I launched a Mind Clip Behavior, which is a, a team development app that helps teams, you know, to, especially now with the remote times, to, you know, work well together, to understand each, each other's behavior and to really work well together, you know, to, to understand that it's not about the winners, it's actually that you need to bring everybody with you because you can't win alone. So this is what we, 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 we we're trying to do with it. So, yeah, it's not always a straight journey. I think, uh, you know, as, as I'm sure many of us know, you know, sometimes we, we take strange turns, but in the end, if we have a clear vision where we want to go, then we go there. I, I would say that even for Accelerator Frankfurt, you know, our long-term vision was always that we're doing this philanthropic thing, and then in the end, we set up a VC fund. Well, we had great planning and great bad timing because, you know, we wanted to launch it last March. <laughs> and of course, it was not maybe the best time. And the funny thing is, maybe what led also to me to, to set up my company was that all the VCs, you know, the people I know told me, Maria, you know, it's, it's impossible to, to raise funds this, at this time. Why don't you just set up your own company and we all give you money? I said, okay. <clears throat> Can you rate my, me a check already? Of course, it doesn't always work this way. But yes, I'm really happy and very excited. And so I can feel for all the entrepreneurs who've been, who've been struggling and you know, fundraising and doing their thing. But I think now we should focus on what is the purpose of tonight. And that is these four amazing ladies. And I give it to Ram. So thank you very much, Maria, for the wonderful opening. Uh, it's been an amazing journey working with Maria, uh, a lot of stress, uh, she pushes me a lot, uh, and uh, a very good example of why it's good to work with women. Uh, <laughs> but uh, what I wanted to say was, uh, yes, it's been, it's been a tricky year for us, uh, but now we're fully online. This, uh, this program online seems to work very, very well. Um, we, we are getting the same results as when we had it in Frankfurt uh, in terms of getting the startups financed. Uh, we're still over 85% uh, success rate. So meaning 85% of our startups are getting financed. So no pressure ladies here, but I need you to also get financed. <laughs> um, and, um, but this wave, wave eight has been super special. Uh, it's, uh, it, it reminded me actually from uh, uh, my surfing career a bit. Uh, I always go back to the surfing and I always try to find analogies. Um, and uh, I remember, you know, in, in surfing, there's always this passion between the surfers. And being in the European Surfing League, uh, you compete against uh, mostly the same surfers over and over again uh, in different waves, in different beaches, in different countries. And I remember in 1996, it was really when I understood the value of being part of something, being part of a collaboration of passionate people helping each other. Um, why I'm saying 1996 is uh, because um, actually uh, Daphna is here. Uh, she, 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 she helped me pitch the first time I nearly drowned. Um, and I told her that there were two times I nearly drowned. Um, and 1996 was the second time uh, I nearly drowned. Yes, I, I, I surf, surfing does have its risks, uh, but uh, I take calculated, calculated risks. Um, and once a perfect wave comes along, it's, it's just worth everything. But uh, in 1996 was uh, when uh, I signed up to my first competition in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, um, I wasn't very experienced in the Atlantic Ocean. I, I used to surf the Mediterranean Sea. And uh, um, the Atlantic is something totally different. The swells are much stronger. The seas are higher, the currents, everything. And uh, I remember uh, kind of uh, thinking to myself, I hope the day of the competition doesn't bring large waves. Uh, <laughs> 
it's almost like Murphy's Law because there was a hurricane in uh, the east coast of the United States uh, about five days earlier, which was sending uh, a huge swell towards uh, the western coast of Europe. This was Portugal. And uh, on the day of the competition, it was the peak of the swell. So the waves were quite big. Uh, something I, I haven't surfed before. And having the experience of nearly drowning uh, a, a couple of years earlier uh, did leave me uh, a bit of scarred and I was very scared. But um, I was already there. Uh, I already made the trip. I'm already in the day of the competition. I can't chicken out. So I decided I'm going in. I started, the clock started ticking. We had 45 minutes on the clock. Uh, paddled to the lineup with the other surfers and these massive sets of waves like mountains uh, passing passing by. Um, it was estimated four to six meter sets uh, with the occasional bigger wave coming at eight meters or something like that. Um, I stayed in the water for about half an hour while the others were taking waves. I was still waiting to get a wave. Um, and then after about half an hour, I took the courage to start paddling for a particular one that was coming my way. And uh, I remember I, I paddled strong, really as strong as I can. And I was determined I'm going to get this wave. And the wave was coming from behind me and was lifting me up basically. And what I didn't know about the Atlantic waves is that they're, of course, I knew they were much stronger, but they also travel at a much higher speed. So without knowing, I was suddenly being lifted so fast uh, up at this mountain of water. And uh, um, also uh, what was quite uh, surprising to me is that when the wave actually, uh, if you think of a four meter wave, when it actually raises up uh, just before it breaks, uh, the, the water level comes down, the lip goes up, and suddenly you have an eight to 10 meter drop to look down. Uh, I hesitated for a split second and that split second uh, was what nearly uh, cost my life actually. Um, I basically, the, the lip of the wave because I didn't commit, I was up here, took me and threw me forward and I fell down plummeting uh, about I don't know, eight, 10 meters into what felt like concrete. Um, and behind me was about 500 tons of liters of water slamming on me. And uh, needless to say, uh, it was such a hard slam that I, uh, I passed out. I blacked out, uh, I don't remember anything. Um, but what did happen, which was uh, very interesting was that the other surfers who were competing against me and we're competing for a spot in the world league, you know, every point counts. They did not hesitate for a second to actually come to the impact zone and risk their lives to get me out of there uh, to shore and to safety. And um, this is what I've seen. This is why I say it a little bit reminds me, wave eight, these ladies. Um, because from that moment on, for me, I was part of a cult. I was part of a family. We were competing against each other, but at the same time, we were pushing each other. We were helping each other and we were looking after each other. And I have not seen that in any of our past waves. Um, normally, the startups in our waves, they're great. Uh, but at the same time, they are trying to get the interest of the investors. They are trying to excel and to be the best uh, over all the rest. Uh, we do try to select startups also based on their behavioral styles to show that they can collaborate and push each other. This is the secret sauce of our success. And, uh, and with the ladies here, uh, I don't know if it's the ladies or the, just that we selected the right people. Um, I was extremely nervous to start a wave with only female founders. Oh my God. Uh, but it's amazing how you four collaborated with each other. It's amazing how you helped each other. You encouraged each other in hard times. I know there's been hard times. Um, 
I did not have to to follow up on you. I did not have to push you. Uh, I didn't. I, I really. You made my job easy and really pleasurable to be around. And it doesn't happen uh, with uh, the previous uh, startups. So I really want to want to thank you uh, for that. Um, I hope you got what you needed from this program. Um, Accelerator Frankfurt, I'm very proud to own it and to say that we are one of the top accelerators in the world. And I hope that we've proven it to you four ladies. Um, but we are the best accelerator, not because of Maria and myself, but it's because of the success of the startups, of you. So your success means our success. So all the best for today's uh, pitches and uh, I'm sure you're gonna keep on making us proud. I always end my speech on every demo day that you never really live an accelerator. You're part of our family now, you're stuck with us. <laughs> so all the best, handing it back to Maria, thank you. And I'm learning to unmute myself, so thank you. Yes, so I think uh, what we'll start now is with the pitches. But before that, I would like to our lovely jury, one at a time, to, to present themselves and their company a little bit and, uh, and tell why are they excited to, to be here today. So from my screen, I think I have first here uh, Diana. Diana, I'm sorry. Yes, hi. Hello, everyone. My name is Diana Heisey. I've been uh, working in the banking industry for more than 20 years now in different roles in international banks. And this year I joined uh, Silicon Valley Bank in Frankfurt. Uh, for those of you that don't know uh, Silicon Valley Bank, we have been focused on the innovation economy for more than 35 years, uh, supporting startups, uh, fast growing tech and healthcare companies and their investors as well. And uh, well, SVB has expanded outside of the US and is now present in nine countries, most recently in Canada and Denmark. And since 2018, we're here in Frankfurt as well. So we could also say that we're start, a startup in, in Frankfurt. And um, well, basically, um, among all great things I could tell you about SVB, I think it's re really important that we really care and it is part of our values, uh, you know, to have empathy and embrace diverse perspectives. And we are aware that we need to create an environment for those who are underrepresented to thrive. I mean, not only at SVB, but also in the innovation economy. And that is why today I'm delighted to be here at an all uh, women demo day, because that's uh, part of the, you know, the values that we try to support. So looking forward to today. Amazing. Thank you very much, Sayonara. And I think the next one I have here is from Kai from Cavalry. Yes. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Kai. I've been with Cavalry for about two years. I'm an associate in the investment team. Um, essentially, my background is one of a, a business student who turned computer scientist afterwards. I've been with a small startup, actually, from Berlin. Uh, received funding from some of the Berlin ecosystem uh, up to a series B of 50 million. So I had the pleasure and, and the luck and the, the fortune, to be honest, to build up a sales and business development team and sort of scale the, the business side of things and learn a lot about startups, about founders, about VCs and how the entire ecosystem works. And so my expectation for today is to obviously give back uh, take you girls to the next stage, uh, obviously help and, and, you know, answer any questions that you may have. Um, so in terms of cavalry, maybe a few words to, to ourselves. We're an early stage investor based out of Berlin. We do angel to series A investments. So from 250K to 1.5 million euros. Um, we may be known for a few companies like Delivery Hero, whom two of our co-founders, Markus and Claude, um, built up in the early days. So they built and, and founded Lieferheld which was then sold to Delivery Hero later on. But we've also been, been investing out of our first fund since 2016 and have recently in 2019 launched our second fund. So Cavalry 2 is live with about 80 million euros and we're trying to aggregate a portfolio of about 30 companies and, and very exotic entrepreneurs. I'm super excited to be honest to, to join this female only session today and, and wave eight. 
um, for the aforementioned reasons. It's it's a bummer. I think women are still underrepresented, whether it's in VC, whether it's in startups, whether it's in founding roles or any other operator roles. And you have so many different values and, and perspectives that we sometimes lack. And I think this is a great, great, great pleasure to get to hear what you are up to, what you're founding and where we can support. Amazing. Thank you very much, Kai. That was, I think, make us all feel good because that is uh, certainly the truth that we can see around us when we don't when we open our eyes properly so the next one is i think one of our i can see that there's two representatives here from taylor westing they have been here you know i think from almost from the beginning and hassan of course always super super you know helpful with all the startups but maria Weyers is gonna say something about taylor westing about herself and why she's here today Please unmute. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I also learning to unmute myself. <laughs> Thank you very much. So yeah, I'm uh, I'm here today representing Taylor Wessing um, to, together with Hassan. Um, Taylor Wessing is an international law firm uh, with a strong focus on venture capital and corporate tech, um, especially also in Germany with five offices in in the bigger cities in Germany, from which we all um, have a venture capital lawyers working in the venture capital space um, and um, we we give legal advice on on the full life cycle of a startup from formation to exit and um, all kind of financing rounds um, i myself I'm, I'm i'm a partner in the in the venture capital space and i work for taylor westing for more than 15 years now um, and i've been involved in venture capital transactions since i started here and um, yeah, I'm, I'm very excited to be here today with all those great uh, female founders um, to see how they go about things and um, to learn how they do it and also to give advice or anything they would need. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you very much, Maria. That was uh, always, always good to hear. And uh, the last representative in the jury is a person who has been, I think, there from the beginning. And he is one of our mentors. And I think he's quite known in the fintech so space. And Michael Mellinghoff, please. Yes. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? <laughs> Maybe speak pick up a little bit or close to the can, microphone, can, but we can, can hear you. Can, can you hear me, in other words? It's, OK. Yeah, hi, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael. Um, I'm a German living in London, and I have a firm that helps fintech founders, male and female, um, to succeed, basically. It's not an accelerator, it's more a tailor-made uh, approach. And um, what I see in London in terms of uh, the fintech scene, which we are focused on, is really um, that it's more diverse than uh, the German fintech scene when it comes to founders. So, uh, congratulations uh, to Maria and Ram that you, as a diversified uh, accelerator, um, can also um, go behind this. Uh, very much appreciated. Uh, besides, um, one of the uh, projects we are also doing with Techtrons is the uh, FinTech Germany Award, which we uh, initiated or co-initiated and co-organized together with uh, two Frankfurt-based partners, Börsen Zeitung and Frankfurt Mind Finance. And uh, we run this now in the fifth year, and I have the honor to co-head uh, the jury there. So uh, I have seen quite a few hundred uh, startups in the past uh, few years. And I'm looking very much forward to uh, what I learned uh, about um, you for companies uh, today. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Michael. And then in the end, I just wanted to ask to all hear about the person who's been really there since the beginning. And we have here Michael um, uh, from, uh, from AGB. And so maybe, Michael, you tell us some words about your thoughts, please. Hi, everybody. It's a, glad, a great pleasure to be here uh, at the, eight, the finishing line of the eighth cohort of Accelerator Frankfurt. I remember Ram and Maria coming to A2B uh, thinking of this idea of creating this accelerator in uh, Germany. And I was so excited and we are still excited to be a part of it. I heard and I know the story that Ram just told you about the surfing. And it's I, I've heard several 
versions of it never so emotional and so beautiful and actually to the point to this cohort. Uh, we are uh, based in Jerusalem. We are helping students, alumni, people from Jerusalem in the area develop their idea into a startup company. We did it for the last seven years. We are doing it all over the world. Accelerator Frankfurt was the first partner of ours uh, behind uh, the borders of, of Israel. And um, we are super proud to be here and help you. I also represent uh, a VC called Launch It Capital. We invest in startups in early stage, uh, 39 startups already and going. And uh, I heard the, some of the ideas and I'm really looking forward to hear your final pitch. Good luck for everybody. Good luck, Accelerator Frankfurt, Maria and Ram. Wonderful, thank you, Michael. We really appreciate, we appreciate it. And so now I think the fun starts and I will give it over to Ram and the ladies. So yes, uh, the, the big day has come. Uh, they've been with us for the last three months. Uh, started off with what, uh, what were ideas. Uh, we went through the Lean Canvas. We helped uh, focus uh, their business models. Um, and without further ado, I want to start with the first pitch. Uh, we're doing it by alphabetical order. So uh, Mia Khan from Eventual. Uh, Mia, please share your screen and all the best. You have five minutes. Yes. So Maria and Ram both talked about the purpose. And I think that when we are kids, we're mostly in touch with our inner purpose. So think about yourself when you were a kid, what made you the happiest by that time? And uh, for me, that was performing arts. I was dreaming of becoming a ballet dancer so much that I would fall asleep every night in my bed in this ballet dancer pose. And I think that I still do that because it kind of stuck. And um, the thing was that my mother couldn't afford these uh, expensive dancing classes because we were living in a small village and it was difficult but I didn't give up. Uh, so I created my own dance concept and made it to the news by the age of 10. Ever since I have walked a long way uh, with um, marketing communications field, um, I've been working with the most, world, most known brands, creating um, campaigns and concepts. And uh, now I'm kind of like uh, going back to my roots, um, to the events industry, not just because of my uh, inner purpose, but because I recognize that there is a huge problem in the, in the event industry. And the problem is this disconnect between the venues and the performers and the crowd. And I can explain to you what I mean uh, by this disconnect. So meet Fabio. Uh, Fabio is this diehard Foo Fighters fan from Italy, Casena, which is also a very, very small village where the bigger name, bigger, well, most known fa famous names would never come to perform. So Fabio didn't give up. Um, he was persistent enough to collect 50,000 euros money and 1,000 musical performances, uh, musicians, to throw a gig together as an attempt to invite Foo Fighters to Casena. And it became viral. And Foo Fighters actually came there to this small village to throw a gig. So there is a huge power in the crowd. But if uh, Fabio had the eventual platform at his disposal, this attempt would have cost him 10 euros. But Fabio is not the only one uh, suffering. Uh, also, the venues are struggling um, because it's really difficult for them to know exactly what the crowd really wants. So they are lacking insight on the sales. And very often it is the case that when there is a band performing, uh, they are performing to an empty venue. And this is of course very risky and problematic sales-wise. Or think about the perform performance performers themselves, like Zoe here in the picture. If they are completely depending on the venues and the promoters, it means that if they if it's uh, risky for the venues, it is also very risky for the performers themselves. So they are lacking income security, especially in the post COVID world. So you can see that the current model of the event industry, how it works, it's broken. 
it's really old fashioned and it's dated and it feels really ridiculous in today's world that when we people get to influence so many things, we don't have influence on what kind of content we want to see. So there's a lot of hassle and dazzle, sales and marketing efforts happening before the event takes place. And then it's catered to the audience that might not pay the ticket. So we have a solution. Eventual is a crowd funding or crowd led platform uh, for, for the people that we get to campaign for the events that they want to see or we want to see. So we basically flip this whole uh, model around uh, so that we give the power for the audience, for the people to campaign for the event content that we want to see. So we basically promise the money in hand before the event takes place so that the venue doesn't take risk, the performer gets paid and the crowd has influence. And this is a future-proof model all about collaboration and influence. And um, to this date, we have been working on the platform development. So technically the platform is ready and we're working and finalizing our brand. So this yellow image is not our brand, uh, it's just a deck. Uh, we're now building partnerships within the uh, events industry and we're looking into launching in April, 2021 here in Finland. And after that, we're ready for the international scaling. And talking about international, um, it goes without saying that the global events industry is very, very big business and it's growing um, approximately 10% per year. And uh, till the year 2026, it is expected to grow up to 2.3 trillion business. So we're talking about a pretty big deal. But what it requires that we are successful in our journey. We're looking, uh, looking for partners and smart money. We're pretty well connected here in Finland, but our aim is to grow internationally and rapidly. So I welcome you to our party, which I guarantee will be bigger after this pandemic than Studio 54 ever was after the Watergate scandal. So if you want to continue discussion, please drop me a line and we can take it from there. Thank you. Well done, well done, <laughs> Mia. So first, uh, first pitch uh, we're through with. Uh, jurors, please, questions. Shoot. Or comments. If you want to comment on the disco cranny. The Michael is ready. Hi. <laughs> well, as I said, I'm more on the FinTech uh, uh, especially in the fintech space, but uh, well, congratulations, Mia. Um, yeah, first of all, to the presentation, a lot with uh, pictures and uh, not too much text and so on, very structured. Uh, I like that. Um, my question would be, what is the or a few questions actually uh, around the crowd? How what's the incentive for the crowd to go uh, behind the, the event in the, in the first? What is the crowd? Can you define the question like? Uh... Well, what's the incentive for the crowd to do the marketing? Crowd to do the marketing. Well, basically the crowd is uh, starting the campaigns for the favorite act. For me, this whole idea started with a very personal cause. I'm really into electronic music and uh, the electronic music scene here in Helsinki is pretty mature and there is a lot happening. But oftentimes it's a lot of local DJs playing and I would wish to see some very special names that four times a year that I nowadays get to go out as a as a mother of um, uh, two kids. So when I get out, get to go out, I really want to see the best name on the stage, like let's say Ricardo Villalobos, but I, I don't get to influence the, it's those taste makers and curators who, who create the content for me. And then if I happen to have that free night and Ricardo is not playing, I'm not going to be happy. The venue might be empty. So I just noticed that there is this disconnect. So it's not that the crowd is basically doing the marketing. The crowd is initiating what they are really interested in so that the venues know what the demand is. Okay. And how uh, does the crowd know about your platform? Crowd know about 
how does let me get rid of this it doesn't seem to be uh yeah sorry i it's a bit unclear how does the crowd know about your platform yeah, so our strategy is to collaborate with the event industry. Uh, so now we're piloting and talking to clubs here in Helsinki. So it all starts with the actors of the event field. So it can be a club, it can be an artist or performer themselves who are promoting a campaign. So basically anybody can initiate a campaign, but we start uh, from the events industry players. Kai? Yeah, um, Michael, Michael is still saying something, but his, I, can't, I couldn't hear you. Classic. No, no still not. Michael, <laughs> you're gone. Okay, Kai, go <laughs> until, ahead until, and ask. <laughs> until you fix it, Michael, I'll, I'll go ahead, right? Um, so my first question would be, what is the business model that you're, that you're aiming for? So how do you earn money on the platform? Yeah, so basically when somebody initiates a campaign, there is a campaign fee um, that is 10 euros. Um, for Fabio, it would have been 10 euros. And then if the campaign becomes successful, so we hit the target, then we're going to take a success fee of the successful campaign. And then when the tickets are issued, we're taking uh, basically 10% um, cut of each ticket sold. So that's the business. Cool. Um, the other question that I have is uh, revolves around the vision. So where do you see eventual in, in 10 years from now? Well, we're global most known brand in the event industry. Uh, let's say that we're the Indiegogo of the event scene. That's the vision. And um, we see that this is a scalable idea. And um, if we are successful, we we, you will hear us uh, hear from us earlier than 10 years, I hope. Mm -hmm. But we're first going to start with Europe because there isn't anything like this in Europe. Do you have any plans for, for going virtual on this? So essentially take, take the leapfrog, so to speak, into the age of, of pure digital, um, digital flows and, and essentially create a virtual event where I could participate from anywhere around the world. Yeah, this is a very good question and we get that very often because obviously this pandemic has shown us that uh, we have such a need for um, events content that it doesn't matter whether what are the circumstances. So obviously we are aware that the virtual format is very popular and there is a big opportunity, business opportunity in the virtual content. But first of all, the reason for our existence is first of all the live um, uh, content but basically our platform is not depending on the format of the event. So for instance, if it's a speaker, for instance, it can be a live event, but I wouldn't feel that electronic music necessarily works in a virtual format for me personally, for somebody it might, but it's definitely an opportunity and where we can um, also work for virtual content. Mm -hmm. Cool, guys, um, we're running a little bit of time, uh, out of time. Maria, would you like a short question? I saw you wanted yeah. to ask. Go yeah, ahead. I just, I just wanted to ask how, how, how are the connections between, I mean, someone starts a campaign, so he signs up on your, on your platform, and then other people say, yes, I, I want this campaign as well. And then how would the venue and, and the performer, I mean, if, if someone starts a campaign, like, like you said, with the Foo Fighters, and he wants to see the Foo Fighters, well, the, 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 the band will be the Foo Fighters, but like the venue, how do, how do they come in? Do you have connections before or do they just jump in and say, oh, we would like to host that? How, how are the connections between the players? That's a really good uh, question. So yes, we're basically a matchmaking platform and that, that's why we are um, connecting at the event industry that we have the connections so that mm -hmm. the venues are aware of our platform and all the campaigns that are running. So then we're matching the right performer with the right venue or even with the promoter. So. Okay, so, so they would basically also sign up for you, with you and so you get the money from them as well then as, as the promotion fee. Yeah, basically a venue also can utilize the platform. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. if it's a consumer or if it's a venue, they can very well start the um, campaign as well. Or okay. the performer can start it, so. 
Mia, okay, thank, thank you, you very, very much. Uh, excellent, uh, excellent stuff. Uh, everybody that hears about this, uh, this uh, idea uh, says always to me, wow, this is, this is amazing. Um, and also Mia, you're amazing. You've got, you've got the right uh, background to, to launch this. You know everything about digital marketing and branding because you come from that industry all your life. So wish you all the best. Um, and we will move now to our next presenter. We're moving uh, away from uh, the wonderful uh, event industry to uh, the very important and serious insurance uh, industry. Um, please, uh, we give the, the screen now to Anu. Uh, I hope I said it right. <laughs> I always have problems with these things, but uh, please Anu, take us away with uh, Neurons. I can't hear you. You're, you're muted. Anu, please unmute yourself. Somehow it doesn't work. Hannah, get ready. Just let me see. Um, ah, there you go. Do you, uh, just a second, do you now see the full screen? So I'm on right. No. no. No? Oh dear. Okay, that doesn't sound good. Let me see. Uh, I'll try it again. There. Yeah. And uh, I'm hoping that now. Yes, it's good. Just a second. It's really... I can see your... It's slow. Does it now work? Yes. Okay. Go so, ahead. Okay, thank you so much. Sorry for a bit of a de delay in the beginning. So. My name is Anu Honkalina. I have a very long background in um, finance and insurance, um, and I'm here to present you the digital lifestyle protection insurance. Let me tell you a bit more how this works. Here is um, a family, a mother um, of two kids. Um, they have just bought their dream house with her husband, and um, they are decorating for Christmas. But somehow Anna is a bit unsure about her ability or their ability to pay their mortgages uh, because of potential unemployment or disability or sickness, especially now that the pandemic is um, raging around the globe. Anna remembers then that she has received an offer for a lifestyle section insurance from her bank while taking the mortgage. And then she goes and reads the offer only to find out that she actually is not eligible for the cover due to being self-employed and working on different projects. Then she starts looking after an alternative lifestyle section insurance online only to find out that there is none. There is no access um, to and, and no options online for a lifestyle section insurance to cover your um, bills or mortgages. She finds out that uh, you can only buy it usually face-to-face -face and from your own lender. There is no personalization of the product. You only get packages which are ready-made by the bank who think they know their customers. And quite often the terms are a bit unclear so that you quite don't know what you're buying, what are you covered for. But luckily for Anna, uh, we are going to be the first online lifestyle section insurance uh, provider which is not provided from your lender. What does that mean? Um, we're offering uh, the, this insurance direct to consumers with per personalized features, which means that you can fit the cover always to your own situation. If, when you're self-employed, when you have something else going on and we are providing clear terms, legal designed and transparent covers where you always know what you're buying. We're also offering guided sales process, which means that you will not make wrong decisions while buying the product. You will know what you're to expect and what you're covered for. Where are we uh, with our go-to-market plan? Um, we're offering the first online direct-to-consumer lifestyle protection insurance. We're planning to grow the portfolio by using search engine optimization and growth hacking. And we will also win customers from the lenders before they sell their product and also after. We will partner with few key distributors 
uh, who are not banks or finance houses. And lastly, we will use our competitors, being the lenders, to market our product because they are uh, required to do that by regulation. Our competitors today, um, they consist of two different groups, white label insurers, who quite often then uh, provide their products through banks and finance houses. The other group is in-house captives who are um, offering usually the products through the banks uh, to their customers. Both of these groups are very often built on a face-to-face -face sales channel and the products are off the shelf, very unflexible, which we're planning to change. We're planning to offer an online product that you can customize for your needs. Our lifestyle section dream team consists of more than 50 years of experience in uh, insurance from two continents. And with the two of us, we can actually run any kind of business, uh, insurance business because of our backgrounds. Our business plan has been built on a steady growth, both on revenue and policies for the first three years in the Nordic countries. We're planning to have more than 25 million euros revenue in the first three years, and also more than 70,000 policies live. The progress we're having currently our MVP, we all already have initial insurance company um, discussions. We're planning to file our license by end of January and our team is ready to start end of March and our uh, planned go live would be April. What we're looking for now is to collaborate with insurance companies. We're looking for an investment of half a million to scale up our growth and hire the team for the first 12 months. And we're also looking for consumer advocates to market this product. So we're hoping you to join us to say in safeguarding your lifestyle. Thank you. Well done. <laughs> Great, Anu. Amazing. Uh, yes, jurors, questions, please. Anu, perhaps leave, leave your... Uh, yes, I'm just about on. to do that there. Yes. No, but you can leave it on, I meant. Oh, but it's fine. Okay. It's all right. Go ahead. I'll just uh, briefly jump in. Anu, thank you very much for, for the presentation. Quite quite intriguing. And again, I'm not necessarily from the fintech space, but it's it's always curious, or I'm always finding it curious to see that so many products are still not digital. And so this is, I, from that angle, I, I already like what you're building. Um, my first question would be, who is the real target customer? So what, what kind of consumer are you, are you aiming for? Is it the self-employed? So what, what sort of age range? Do you have an, an understanding already of these? Yes, um, we have a background of um, 15 years from doing lifestyle protection insurance for global giants. And we know the market pretty well. Um, the, the biggest, um, biggest kind of um, target group would be uh, the people who have mortgages uh, who have car loans or consumer loans, which are fairly significant in size. These people tend to be from 30 to 50 years old uh, with, um, well, they need to be working one way or the other uh, in order to be eligible for the cover to be able to repay back also, of course. Um, and um, self-employed are one of the groups, subgroups, so to say, who are not covered today. So obviously there is the potential for us as well. Mm -hmm. Cool. Next, My, Mizrahi, please. <laughs> you but you are muted. Hi, uh, wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. I want to ask whether this is actually a marketing innovation or a marketing idea, because you're not an insurance company. And if that's so, what's stopping anyone else from copying whatever you are doing? Very good point, and uh, I see see that you have been involved in this uh, type of business earlier, have, uh, asking that kind of question. Uh, you are correct in the way that this is actually a new distribution channel. Um, it is very much about and around how to market, how to promote this, and how to find a new way to distribute this uh, channel. It ties up together with using the latest digitalization tools on, on gamification, on UX design, on um, customer behavior during the buy, uh, buying process. Um, like any, any other idea, nothing stops anybody else to launch this. However, um, 
having worked in the area for 15 years, I don't see any imminent threat from the current incumbents to do this in a way that we have planned due to a number of reasons. But um, yeah, I, I hope this answers your question. It is, thank you very much. Dayanara, please go ahead. Yes, I, I guess that this is a little bit in line. So uh, how will you bring this awareness to the, to the customer? Because I think insurance is something that you're not thinking about until you actually need it. And uh, especially in this, in this segment, uh, how, how you, know, you will actually get into this customer to think about such a product? Very good points again. Um, so, so the um, biggest kind of um, change in how we're planning to bring this to the consumers is actually um, raising the awareness through uh, growth hacking, search engine optimization that is not used today at all. Uh, we need to find the uh, people on the right time when they are already looking for the apartment or when they are searching for the car that they want to finance. And we need to be there either before uh, their lender has offered this product, or if not, then at the latest when they have heard about the product from their lender, or they have already taken it. It's quite easy to actually change from one provider to the other. And we are planning to provide such a, a great product with a smaller price than the current market is um, offering this through. As you can imagine, when these are driven by the lenders, the products are uh, tailor-made for the needs of the lender and not really for the end consumer and therefore the price very much actually follows uh, the, the kind of the wishes of the lenders not so much the wishes of the end consumers so so this is where we are coming in with a very um, flexible product that you can fit um, to, to your own situation I hope this answered your question. Uh, anu, uh, one, one thing to add quickly, uh, you, you, you have uh, this secret weapon, uh, the growth hacker, right? Very much it's true, It's not yes. very secret anymore because I disclosed it, but it's uh, someone yes. I want to meet, <laughs> perhaps mention that. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, we are lucky enough that we have been able to, to, um, to attract to our team, core team, uh, the, the best growth hacker in Finland who has done amazing job in her, in her all earlier uh, places where she's been providing this. She's also um, uh, teaching uh, growth hacking uh, in, in Finland. So she's definitely the best person to start this with. So I'm, I'm very confident that we can actually deliver the numbers that we have projected. Any last burning question? We are allowed. No. All right. Anu, amazing. Uh, what a transformation. <laughs> uh, I see Daphna there. Uh, Daphna, by the way, one week ago uh, prepared all them for, for the pitches. You can see the session online on our YouTube channel. Um, but uh, thank you to Daphna. <laughs> <laughs> great. Uh, and we're moving now to, um, well, I call her the corporate girl, but I don't think she's much of a corporate girl anymore, is she? Uh, Hannah, you're up. The show, the, the, the stage is yours. Please go ahead. Welcome. Thank you. I just uh, make sure that I have the uh, right uh, sharing. Do you see the full screen well? Yes, absolutely. Good. I see nice little minis. I love that. That's good. That's my <laughs> husband's photo. <laughs> ah, nice. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Hanna Kekkonen. I'm the founder of the Idea Pillar. It's a matchmaking platform for circular, circular economy. I have background in chemical industry and I'm a fanatic circular economy believer. But I'm also a mother and uh, I'm really worried about uh, my kids. Uh, I have three and I would really like them to have a future. Uh, because we are uh, at a tipping point right now. Uh, so uh, this month, end of 2020, uh, the human made objects way more than uh, living things. 
and uh, we can't not continue like this just producing and, and throwing out it's it's uh, really not good and uh, we are now looking at the textile industry and what you see here uh, is, is really treasure. So this textile is actually high quality textile. Did you know that there's a difference? Generally, the textile industry is really, really wasteful and polluting. So we have a lot of uh, um, problems like you see here on the slide, like uh, the high light or low light, I would say 85% uh, ends up in landfills. But it doesn't have to be like that. We don't have to burn the textile. We don't have to send it uh, to the landfills. Uh, so actually, uh, with Pillar, our circular uh, economy matchmaking platform, uh, we want to approach a circular economy from the waste side of things and connect it with chemical innovation. Because with uh, chemistry, you can actually uh, change the processing of the waste so that it becomes new, uh, really nice, uh, new raw material. So what we want to avoid that waste, waste is created and we want to avoid that new uh, natural resources are used. Uh, before uh, building a platform, uh, I'm now pillar because I'm doing the matchmaking manually. So here you see a lot of companies, like four or five different companies within the textile industry uh, that has different things uh, that when connected, that could be, be really nice uh, use cases. So here you see uh, with me, with Pilar, what happened. So we had the company getting rid of the high quality textile. We have the recycler having the uh, textile waste and look what comes out of it. So here you have textile waste and uh, here is some coatings on it and then it feels like uh, velour. Uh, so this is how this to totally makes sense. And I can confirm that one company's waste is the other company's raw material. So it's really uh, like this. Uh, so if I look at the product, so what are we? We are the first one-stop waste management platform. Uh, so uh, there are some other players, but some are collecting waste. Uh, some, some are uh, focusing on the certificates. Some uh, have certificates and collaboration, but we are really uh, trying to focus on everything and with an additional uh, aspect of the chemical access to chemical innovation. Looking at the business model, so we are a waste broker, so we would start with transaction fees, but the complete market potential is really huge. So only in Germany in 2020, the estimated revenue of the industry uh, is 42.4 billion and 31.6% of that is the sub-industry of waste collection. Uh, this is our team, so we are in the early ideation phase. Top right, you see all the volunteer great uh, help that I had in this uh, mentoring phase at Accelerator Frankfurt. In the next stage where we will found Pillar, we have a smaller focus team with platform build expertise uh, and uh, chemical expertise and marketplace uh, expertise. Uh, this is the project plan. Uh, so now we are at the demo day, but the highlight definitely was when we uh, started talking to the Finnish company Globe Hope, which is a textile recycler and BSF coatings that uh, has uh, the coatings to put uh, on the uh, textile. So these two are now collaborating. Now we are at the demo day and the next highlight will be the Rhein-Neckar hackathon. Uh, where uh, Generation Z will <laughs> build a prototype. So young people will uh, build a prototype. Uh, yes, and then we want to found, and of course we want to scale this. Uh, so what would I need for you? So this is uh, early stage, but uh, this is really the Tinder for waste management. So be, be part of it. Uh, Pilar, uh, discover, uh, connect me with companies. Uh, that would have interest and, and discover ways as your new resource. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Great, great job. And uh, love the topic uh, of circular economy. There's so much potential to be done here. Go ahead, uh, jurors, questions? Michael, I hope. 
Can you hear me now? Yes, we can ah, hear you. Wonderful technology in the end. Uh, thank you for the presentation, Hannah. Um, super important topic, obviously. Um, nothing to do with fintech, so I can only ask uh, questions uh, in order to improve my understanding. How does a waste broker work? So what do you do, actually? Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm uh, connecting uh, different uh, players that wants to enter circular economy. So, for example, I talked to this textile um, collector uh, in Helsinki, Globe Hope. Uh, so they have the problem that they only get these textiles in uh, this cut format. And they, then they don't know uh, what they do with it. They, they get a lot of textile, it's cut it, but they are interested in uh, give, putting it into the carpet format. Uh, and then the, you have a carpet, uh, another company that makes it into a carpet. Then you have a third company who creates these coatings that you can put on it. And Pillar is actually matchmaking. So I'm in the phase now to interview these companies and doing the matchmaking manually. And it's really promising because it is like this. And I think the key is really the chemical innovation in the processing of the waste, because this is something small and medium sized businesses don't normally have access to. So eventually when this is automated, will it be a big data thing? Uh, yes, so we will have a recommendation engine uh, that creates uh, um, um, uh, based on data, individual recommendations. Uh, and Hannah, <clears throat> hello, this is Hassan here. Uh, I'm not on the jury, so apologies for, for butting in. Uh, but, but you don't offer any chemical process advice, do you? It's, it's, it's a pure matchmaking uh, platform where you, over time, build a database of companies that say, I would like this and that type of, of, of waste, uh, and where can I procure it from, from, from which companies? So, but you, you're not going to go and sort of give advice on you know, which are the best chemical processes to, 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 to actually achieve the desired result? No, but I have the network to the um, uh, chemical industry. So I will, of course, provide uh, the people that have this knowledge also as players uh, into this platform so that they can uh, gain from the uh, creativity of these recyclers that have the ideas where can we put these uh, ma materials and uh, mm. uh, then they can say the chemical innovators, we would like to have the material in this and this format. We, we can make yoga mats or we can put it into envelopes. Mm. So it becomes a know-how repository as well, does it? Yes. Not only matchmaking, but actually people can say with this type of waste, I can actually produce this type of product. Yes, and especially innovation. So new ways of using the waste. So this is the... Mm. Uh, a differenting factor to the other companies that you saw. This is really this chemical uh, access to chemical innovation. Mm, okay, and and the the uh, the monetization, I guess, to the extent you've given it some thought, would be some kind of a uh, a SaaS model where you would be, you know, people would be paying on a on a transaction based <clears throat> or on a access based. Yes, I'm giving that a lot of thought. Uh, I also have a big background in data management um, and, and a project called Data to Value. So I'm thinking about a data coalition so that uh, people get incentivized to return to the platform also when the initial match is made. Uh, so that people can get back uh, or see value that it's not uh, preserved like uh, a, a pure marketplace, mm -hmm. but uh, they have long-term uh, partnership can be built because these waste processes uh, can be a very heavy investment in technology uh, for the waste processing and so on. So we have to really uh, incentivize people to come back to the platform. And I think this can only be done if you give something back uh, a share uh, based on the data that you share. So this is something we need to work on really in the next uh, phase. Yeah, it's an interesting one. I'll stop asking questions because I think time is <clears throat> is limited. Uh, but I think it's it's an interesting. I interesting. can connect you later, guys, uh, mm -hmm. for sure. <laughs>
Any more questions? Uh, jurors, anyone else? We have another minute. So yeah. from my side, really, I think what what would be key is to, to get a proper understanding around what is it that you're building up in the first vertical, so textiles that you can leverage and reuse in adjacent verticals, right? So sort of in later on in three years and two years to scale the business. Yes, exactly. Uh, so uh, we want to get into textile to understand uh, what would bring bene benefit to use this platform uh, with, with real companies, but of course the other commercial waistline like plastics, uh, glass, uh, car tires. So one of the companies that I talked with, they said, hey, I'm also looking for car tires or I'm looking for pigments for organic waste. So as soon as you start to talk with one company, then they need a lot of other uh, stuff as well. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, they came into this innovation models and now they talk to each other and they are now creating new projects uh, with, with uh, new ideas. So this is interesting, right? It's a very strong network effects model where you where you rely upon or essentially need to onboard as many suppliers and demanders on from both ends uh, to create more and more value. But overall, super interesting, and uh, we, we've been looking at one or the other competitors on on the slides as well. So we're we're not unfamiliar with the models. They are to some extent complex, right? And this is something that you will have to you will have to handle and sort of uh, work find a workaround. Very good, guys. Uh, thank you so much, um, Hanna. Uh, you were supported by uh, by great people, and I see two of them here. I think Sadie and uh, Lena are here. Sadie is in Denmark. Lena is in Germany. Uh, so thank you for supporting Hanna through 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 this uh, program, and uh, great job. Big things to come. Thank you. Great. So, uh, guys, final pitch of the day. Uh, wow, demo day eight. Uh, it's uh, soon coming to an end. Um, but last but not least, I want to welcome uh, Carla Schönicke. Please go ahead. Hi. So, let me share my screen. Oh, um, I'll be right back. I need to give it the permission to share. In any case, I'm 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 very pleased with with the the progress. You 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 guys. Uh, I mean, these ladies came in with really what were mere ideas, most of them, and. Uh, and this is why it's called acceleration, uh, because they, they came from idea phases really to uh, to these uh, to these presentations uh, and almost ripe for investment. So pre-seed, seed. Here, Carla's back with us now. Yeah, and now I need the sharing permissions from you. Now you need the sharing permission. <laughs> I'm coming to Berlin and you are buying me a beer for this. Oh, I will definitely. No worries. Thank you. Um, I had to set up, set up my Mac this morning again, so this is all caused by that. Yeah, um, right. All right. So, um, what do all the of these following three cases have in common? So, you're applying for a visa to the UK, and it's denied because, as it turns out, um, the algorithm behind it is racist or you're applying for a loan, and like it happened last year with the Apple card, if you happen to be a woman, you just get a very, very much lower credit frame approval. Or you're applying for a job, and like two years ago with Amazon, the screening bot decides that only male applicants are better for IT jobs. So you don't get that either. And now you're wondering, how can that be? Why is nobody responsible for that? And the typical answer is usually, ah, it's the AI, we can't do anything. Well, we can do something, and it's giving that AI bias-free data. Bias-free data is, wants to enable data scientists to build bias-free AI models and thereby unlock business opportunities for their companies. 
So let's look into bias free data. What's actually the problem with data bias? So AI models don't just take over the bias, they amplify the bias. So the situation gets worse. It's now a rule. Also, you will lose business opportunities because these AI models will make some recommendations that are unfavorable. And lastly, very likely if this becomes public, you will have reputation damages and even fines to pay. In fact, nine out of 10 companies have reported that there has been some ethical uh, issues with some of their AI systems. In comes bias-free data, which wants to make AI models more fair and unlock bias opportunities, uh, business opportunities by offering bias-free data sets. And the clue is that we don't want to focus on images or video, actually we want to focus on the most data, the transaction data that is present in the world. Like when you apply for a job or make a transfer, send back a, a package, order something online, that's all transaction data. So there's huge amounts of uh, transaction data out there and it's very, very biased. So in order for companies to work on better business opportunities, we will provide curated training sets. So this gives them bias-free data to train their AI models on and um, yeah, unlock those opportunities. And at the same time to establish trust with their customers, we will test their models and rate their performance like with Michelin stars. Passion for fair tech means uh, deep knowledge and bias. And uh, why do we actually do that? Because we believe technology should benefit us humans, both the consumers, but also the businesses instead of holding us back. So um, the reason that I've chosen this idea or it has chosen me is because uh, I'm a senior product manager at a global SaaS company. And I also recently were trained in anti-Semitism discrimination counseling. And I was among the top 10 of a global LGBT plus leadership contest and completed diversity training. I won the pitch competition at Exathon 2020. And I've also applied for the high tech seed lab in Antler to carry this idea further. The business model behind it is a data commerce platform and model ratings. So we would sell those bias free data sets specific to the domains. And of course, there's different tiers depending on the volume and the complexity of the data sets, and we would charge for updates. And we also test and rate the AI models. Uh, of course, there will be a fee for each certificate. Now, if we look at the market, um, there are already synthetic data startups. Uh, they claim to care about bias too, but they rather do it on the side and not really thoroughly in all the dimensions. If you look at current data marketplaces, they don't have any indication of quality at all and bias is also not among them. And then there's two startups that are trying to take a nick, a nick at it. Abacus is um, taking care of produ production monitoring from AI models and unbiased.cc is more about fake news uh, detection with blockchain. So this is kind of an untapped market, but it's huge. So worldwide spending in AI will inc increase double uh, by 2024 to 110 billion. And in Europe, it will even triple from last year's 7 billion to 21 billion 2023. So the go to market plan is right now we're in the validation phase, talking to many data scientists and uh, probable candidates with use cases. And we want to win our first play, uh, paying client very soon in the new year and then build partnerships and scale. So let's unlock AI business opportunities together. Thank you. Well done, Carla. On the spot, exactly five <laughs> minutes. <laughs> so questions. Questions, anybody? Michael. Yeah, going uh, first again. Thank you for the presentation. Nice storytelling. Um, when you uh, talked about, or before you talked about your business model, I assumed it's uh, basically consulting business and uh, the rating, but then you said your business model also comprises um, selling data. So my one question will be, uh, how do you get the data in the first place? Yeah. <laughs> and secondly, how do you avoid an unconscious bias in cleaning the data? Okay, I, I see you have some knowledge there. So <laughs> answer, answer to the first question is, um, 
So consulting would not be scalable. And my intention is really to build a scalable tech business. Um, so uh, like building these data sets and selling them. And of course, consulting manual work would there be in the beginning, but then uh, later on, it should really, really scale. Um, and of course, you can automate a lot of stuff. And of course, the you have a lot of bias along the way. You have bias in the data collection. That's, I think, what you are kind of referring to. You have bias in the pre-processing of data. And then also later, when the models are already running, like the production monitoring, where is it going? Is it drifting? And the only real um, kind of countermeasure there is to have a lot of different perspectives on that. So I'm planning to build a very diverse team and have also different mentors. And I'm well connected in the diversity and inclusion scene already for the last uh, four years. So I have no worries in there. Um, and of course, like monitoring and, and setting benchmarks and measuring the outcomes constantly uh, is one way to, to tackle that. Thank you. The other Michael? Ah, Kai. I have, yes, I have another okay. question as well. Um, thank you very much for the presentation, Carla. Uh, it's, it's quite an interesting and an intriguing problem. And one could go even further to say, right, that in, in the United States, there, there is data being sold to government agencies, i.e. to the police, um, mm -hmm. on, on sort of crime or criminal actions and, and crime prediction, leading to mm -hmm. an even more biased data set, hence black people being pursued by the police for no reasons. And this is, this is an even bigger issue. But I, I really like the approach. And I really like what, what you're trying to go for. What I currently still don't understand is, which data domains essentially would you want to focus on, right? Because data per se is, is vast and is huge. Mm -hmm. And understanding which domain you want to focus on, the next question would then be, is providing the data, would you have uh, a proprietary access to this data? And, and, and I'm assuming in some cases not. So my question is, would providing data really be the best focus for you? Or could even sort of finding biases in the first place be an even bigger value lever for you, or at least a lever into the market. Yeah, and, and the what you just mentioned uh, was actually like my original idea to find existing bias in the historical data of companies. Turns out this is not scalable at all. So the idea was to have algorithms that would run over data sets and figure out some kind of bias. But mm -hmm. since bias is such a soft uh, you know, topic, it's really hard to teach an algorithm what, how does bias look like in one data set and then the context completely changes how does it look like in the other one that's why i'm now going for this more standardized curated data sets which i will like either take from open data sources that already exist now um, mm. or what you can also do is partner with um, data marketplaces and they get kind of a cut and you take their already existing data sets and make them bias free so you have again this more established trust Right now, like talking to a lot of data sets, that's really the, the most scalable, most technical way into bias that I see. But I would love to discuss it if you have other experts at hand. Mm. I think the a very cool way to go about it, right? Because I think you mentioned the, the lone example of, of women receiving worse, um, mm -hmm. essentially worse terms in, in borrowing cash or whatnot. Uh, is to be able to really to truly compare the cost for a potential customer, right? So what what kind of money are you losing out on based on a wrong or sort of a, a biased data set? Mm -hmm. And that's again sort of plays back into into that question is understanding what domain of data you want to focus on and sort of take that as a first vertical rather than going very broad into the space and say we mm -hmm. we solve bias in data. Yeah. So a, a very obvious one is the landing one and. Uh, it has already been shown that if the face-to-face -face lending conversation is moved to, to online um, and the, the bankers don't see that person being a woman, already women get more credit. So um, that, that lending is a very obvious choice. Of course, uh, I'm, I'm talking to um, yeah, banks. That's a little bit complicated because of all the NDAs and, and regulations and so on to have them work with a startup at that early stage. Uh, but I'm talking to some. Uh, another very obvious one is HR, um, so that you look into uh, bias-free hiring, so really the best person gets into the company and they're not losing candidates because of bias. Um, and then you could even think about helping HR building their, um, their hiring uh, bots themselves, assisting in that way. 
or partnering with ATS, like applicant tracking systems like uh, Greenhouse and, and Bamboo and so on to give them uh, the possibility to do that bias free hiring. Yeah. Actually, like in, in one hour, I think I have the next call with an HR uh, um, department from Dell just to discuss this. <laughs> nice. Great to hear. Uh, That's fantastic. <laughs> um, Carl, Carl Heinz, uh, one of our mentors, uh, wants to ask a question. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Ram. Thanks, Carla, for your presentation. Uh, one question from my side, maybe I didn't really get it right, but uh, once uh, with regard to your, with your um, mentioned proof of concepts at the beginning of your presentation, they all relate to personal data. So I guess it would be a bigger issue if you want to train or if you want to analyze based on personal data with regard to the general data protection regulation mm -hmm. or in Germany called DSG uh, mm -hmm. VO. So how do you anonymize, anonymize data or what you also mentioned is that you synthesize data. So what's your approach? Because I guess whenever you get uh, with, in touch with a client, that would be one of the first questions. How can you assure that the data is anonymized and how you identify what will be the drift based on real data or what is the drift based on synthesized data, for example? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so if you're how, talking how about... Uh, if, if you're talking about the production monitoring and uh, figuring out the drift, that would be on premise at a company. And then they would, of course, have the right to look into their own data. So in that case, like there wouldn't be any synthesized data. Um, of course, anonymization uh, has like the reputation of being like revertible. So you can actually find out data again. So it, it's not safe. That's why there's a lot of uh, synthetic uh, data startups um, at the same time you have to be careful, as you say, not to introduce like false uh, assumptions in when you synthesize data. So that's a very tricky point. And here I also say this is kind of, I'm, I'm the business person behind it. I come from the bias and diversity side uh, and the data scientists that I'm working with, we're trying to make a prototype and we probably run also in, in more, uh, more trouble. Um, right now, we have to still find like a, a solution for that, but we are aware. So I can't tell you the solution. We're working on it with a prototype. Okay, thank you. Awesome, everybody. Um, uh, the, the four ladies, please unmute yourself and uh, give a big round of applause to yourselves, to each other, so we can hear this. Hey. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Was, uh, was really amazing. It was a pleasure to, to have you on Wave 8. Um, I want to thank the members, uh, the mentors who have been active with us on this wave. We didn't involve all the mentors. Uh, it was uh, a little bit of a, of a more condensed uh, wave. We had Andre uh, from, um, from Deep Work Studio. We have Rita Muntonen, Nina Rinke, Tatiana Wild, Jako Salminen, Akko Hapu, Daphna Goldmelchior, Michael Menninghoff here, and Michael Mizrahi. So really thank you for making this, uh, this program uh, fantastic. Ah, and Nimrod Kramer. I almost forgot Nimrod. Um, and I will pass it. Uh, I, I'm going surfing uh, this weekend. Uh, I haven't surfed since uh, January because of the lockdown. But so far, my flights have not been canceled, so I'm off to the beach, um, leaving it off to Maria. Thank you so, so much for the warmth, for the passion. Amazing. So, yes, I have to say I am not going surfing, but I'm going to Lapland and there is snow. So I'm very happy for that. I'm going to make some snow angels and, you know, relax, read books and stuff like that. But, uh, yes, I have to say thank you. Especially thank you, our four female founders, amazing ladies, Anu, Mia, Carla, and Hannah. Thank you. Without you, it wouldn't be what it was. So we really appreciate everything that we also learned during the journey. And of course, as Ram already mentioned, we thank all the mentors, not all that here, but you know, those who are here, we appreciate you being there. And of course, 
without the sponsors, you know, life, you know, you need some butter on the bread so that everything works smoothly. So we really appreciate we Cavalry appreciate Ventures, you. Kai, we have, uh, Silicon Valley Bank, Dayanara, and Taylor Wessing, of course, with Marianne Hassan. We really appreciate you thank all. You. And Tim, for the production, without you, we wouldn't even be here. So thank you very much. And uh, yeah, Tim actually has his uh, new startup. So you might hear about that later, streamers. Stream Boost. So uh, he's helping all these little um, um, streamers, micro uh, influencers, so to say, to make some, some bucks. Also, we all need to you know, stay alive. So if you want to do something for actually Frankfurt, I think we, of course, think of continuing this, our philanthropic journey uh, online. But you can sign up the newsletter if you haven't done already, or you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook. And of course, this video is also available on, on, on Facebook and Twitch, and also the previous uh, workshops that the startups have been doing. So maybe if there are some female founders there who did not join the program, but are interested about this, so do it. So last words, happy holidays. Let's stay in touch and let's stay all healthy and face, uh, fa safe, <laughs> difficult world. So be well and prosper. Over out. Team, take us out. <laughs> Thank you.